This is an instructional video of the key steps of robotic radical prostatectomy. I'm Dr. Kathan Badani, and I'll be demonstrating to you my technique. This and that's removed. Now I put tension on the prostate, pull it medially, and gently incise in the space between the levator muscles and the prostate. And the space behind the endopelvic fascia is very easily and bluntly separated. No cautery is used at this point. Again, the neurovascular bundles are near. And this is a vascular plane without any large vessels that would require cautery, especially near the base of the prostate. Up high, uh, near the apex, the tissue is a little bit firmer, and sometimes gentle cautery is necessary to divide this because I tie a slip knot. So here I make a pass a little bit more distal than the first pass and bring it out through to the other side around the same exit point as my previous stitch. As you can see, cinch it down just enough to get the knot down and then I throw the second one with my right hand and then because this is a caperson stitch or a non-braided stitch I can slide the knot down as demonstrated here. Identification of the bladder neck. Here I've switched to a 30 degree downward facing lens and I'm just identifying the prostatal vesicle junction. My fourth arm is giving cephalad traction of the bladder and my Foley balloon has been deflated. And here, this junction is easily seen now with the bladder entering directly into the prostate. Find this to be the easiest way to identify this junction. And then I take this plane straight down, aiming towards the prostate till I get down to urethra. I'm staying in the same plane. I'm in the soft white tissue of the detrusor muscle. So I know I haven't gone too distal. I'm giving a little extra traction with my fourth thumb, as you can see the stretching of the tissue. And that counter traction is crucial to the step because it allows visualization. And here the Foley is encountered. And I've stayed in the detrusor. And here I'm excising the superior edges of my dissection, again, to minimize the size of the bladder neck. Once I've done the lateral sides, I can adequately see inside the bladder and know exactly how wide I want to make it. I look in, identify the trigone, which is seen far below. And so I know I have plenty of space to continue my bladder neck dissection. This gentleman does not have a median lobe or large lateral lobes, so no tailoring of the bladder neck will be necessary. The assistant, again, is pulse suctioning the smoke as it's created and now giving me downward traction on the bladder to expose the plane I've created. And you can just see the beginning of the vas deferens. Seminal vesicle dissection. Here the vas deferens have been further dissected and the left and right vas deferens have been identified. Creating a plane in between the two vas deferens and the seminal vesicles just to further elucidate the anatomy. Posterior to non VAs is grasped and an incision is made approximately one centimeter below the base of the vas deferens. The perirectal fat is visualized and used as a plane. At this point, two planes can be developed one between the non VAs and rectum, or one above the non VAs between the capsule of the prostate and the non VAs fascia. right-sided, standard, or traditional nerve sparing. Uh, this is the traditional posterolateral nerve sparing uh, as opposed to the lateral prostatic fascia nerve sparing, which will be shown in a separate video segment. Here the pedicle of the prostate was clipped using hemolock clips and divided. Again, we're doing a minimal nerve sparing operation on this gentleman given his poor erectile function preoperatively. However, the clips not only provide an athermal means, but they also are better hemostatic maneuvers for any large venous sinuses that may exist in this area. So here, once the pedicle is divided, that plane is found between the capsule of the prostate and the nerve bundle. You can see the shiny white capsule of the prostate, making sure I leave a small rim of tissue on the prostate itself. The left-sided nerve sparing, the hemolock clip is 
precisely placed at the pedicle of the prostate. And divided. My fourth arm is giving me counter traction on the bundle, and my assistant is giving me upward traction with his grasper. The pedicle is divided, and the same plane between prostatic capsule and bundle is found. The rest of this fibrotic tissue from the posterior dissection is now gently freed up. Transaction of dorsal vein. So at this point, identification is made of the dorsal vein in the urethra, and a healthy margin of tissue is left at the apex. Here, the, sti the stitch was not placed before transection of the dorsal vein. And in many instances, I do this because my area of incision is sometimes hindered by the stitch placement. So I will transect the dorsal vein first and then oversew it after. So here, no stitch was placed, and the dorsal vein is transected. The pneumoperitoneum can be made to be higher during this part of the operation to allow adequate hemostatic visualization. Uh, you do have to tolerate slightly more blood loss, and when we studied this on average, there was 35 cc's more blood loss. Urethral transection, the junction between the apex of the prostate and urethra is identified, and using cold cut, incision is made down to the Foley catheter. My fourth arm, again, is giving cephalad traction of the prostate to allow adequate visualization at this point. The Foley is withdrawn, and the rest of the urethra is transected. It is important to check the posterior surface of the urethra, as sometimes there is prostate tissue and a large prostatic lip on the undersurface of the urethra. Here, looking laterally and underneath, there does not appear to be any prostatic tissue, and so we can safely divide at this level. You can see the Vera Montanum, and I'm dividing precisely distal to the Vera Montanum to maximize urethral sphincter length. And being careful to check for any prostatic tissue that may be present and projecting underneath the urethra. And the rest of this posterior urethral tissue is gently swept and divided. The specimen is now free. And the anastomosis has begun. Here we employ the same 3 0 monocryl on an RB1 needle dyed and undyed, tied together. And a bite was already taken on the posterior bladder neck, the urethra. This is the second bladder neck bite. Full thickness. And the second posterior urethral bite. The first bite taken at 5 o'clock on the urethra, and the second bite taken at 6 to 7 o'clock, encompassing all of this posterior urethral tissue. The posterior plate of the anastomosis is by far the most important strength layer. It is important to take adequate and robust bites of this tissue. Once the three sutures on the bladder neck and two on the urethra are completed, the bladder can be easily cinched down tension-free. You have to ensure nothing is holding the bladder, including your fourth arm or the assistant grasper. The clear stitch is cinched. The urethra and bladder are nicely opposed. You can check around the corner, make sure there are no gaps, as there are not. And again, you're using visual cues to ensure snugness of your stitch. Since you don't have tactile and haptic feedback, you have to rely on those visual cues. And if the suture is not pulling any further, 
it's a good cue to stop as breaking a sutra at this point would require you to redo the whole, if not a good part of the anastomosis. And the final suture is thrown, and the anastomosis is complete.